Welcome to Nova Academy. My name is Alex Crosser and I'm head of online learning. We're very excited to present the Pandemics and Public Health Initiative designed to help teens around the world be better informed about one of the most impactful events of the modern era. The COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented challenge to our modern systems of healthcare, but pandemics have threatened public health throughout history. What is a pandemic? How does it spread? And what lessons have we learned from the past that we can apply today? To help us answer these questions, along with some questions submitted by our students from around the world, we're very fortunate to be joined today by Dr. Don Goldman, a professor of immunology, infectious diseases, and epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, Don, in a few words, uh, could you introduce yourself to our students and describe a little bit of your background as it relates to our conversation today? Sure. Uh, I'm actually a history major uh, at, in, uh, in college, uh, but uh, when I became a physician, it was pretty clear to me I was much more interested in infectious diseases and epidemiology than I was uh, in sitting in the basement of some library uh, studying ancient texts uh, and getting, uh, getting musty and half blind. So uh, for me, getting out and actually dealing with uh, epidemics and trying to help people that way was uh, much more appealing. Uh, and importantly, I did spend two years as what's called an epidemic intelligence service officer, fancy title, uh, for somebody that uh, works at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at the United States uh, and goes out and tries to solve uh, epidemics. Cool. Was there a moment where you went, aha, this is it. I want to study epidemics. Uh, yeah, it was actually when I broke my leg uh, as a um, house officer trainee at Massachusetts General Hospital uh, and uh, had to have a presentation. And uh, I got interested in the art of the plague, the Great Black Death, and uh, brought in all these images of artwork from the 14th century and began to think this is really cool. And uh, uh, just got more and more interested and ended up at the CDC. Cool. You never know where your passions are going to lead you, I guess. Well, I teach a lot of art when I talk about plague. I think you can learn a lot by looking at uh, infectious diseases through other lenses, through music, through uh, cinema, uh, through literature, and uh, especially through art. And I'm sure the internet culture today is going to be fascinating to study in a couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> So are you able to get involved in help directly uh, to help stem the, stem the spread of COVID-19? So as you can see, I'm uh, an old guy uh, in a high risk group for COVID-19. And, and actually, uh, I think about four years ago, I stopped seeing patients. Uh, I was at Boston Children's Hospital as an infectious disease uh, consultant and uh, ran our response to uh, some infections we had in the relatively recent past like SARS and Ebola and so forth. But I don't see patients anymore. I mainly teach. Uh, in fact, I'm teaching a virtual course uh, in infectious diseases and social uh, injustice now to high school kids, uh, three of whom are in Vietnam and Thailand. So uh, it, it, this is kind of fun and I enjoy the being a, a gray beard, a beard and an advisor. I feel like educating people is doing something. So uh, thank you very much for your service uh, in the past and today. Um, so I guess we should probably start at the beginning. Uh, and I've been reading a lot of articles about um, coronavirus and, and COVID-19. Uh, and they're all very careful to say a novel or the novel coronavirus, a new coronavirus. Can you describe what, what is a novel virus and what makes it so dangerous? Well, they're, they're two separate questions. So I'll talk about why people say it's novel. First of all, everybody listening to this call, I promise you has had more than one coronavirus infection already. Uh, and that's because it's one of the most uh, common causes of a cold. So uh, I get colds two, three times a year. And I'm promising you that even though I don't go to a virology lab to have it worked up, that at least one of them is due to coronavirus. So coronaviruses are circulating all the time. We know a whole lot about how they cause infection. In fact, there was a, a laboratory on the Salisbury Plain in the middle of uh, England near Stonehenge where people were inoculated with viruses to see uh, how they cause infection. And that's one of the reasons we say don't touch your nose or don't touch your eyes because that's a 
route of entry. So we have coronaviruses all the time. There have been three coronaviruses that I think one could say are novel. Uh, uh, the, uh, one of them was SARS. Uh, and if you know what this current virus is called, it's SARS-CoV-2. So SARS-CoV-1 was SARS uh, that originated uh, in Hong Kong, as you remember it physician came from Guangzhou, I think it was, and then stayed in a hotel, and then it spread in Hong Kong and eventually Toronto and became a global threat. And for reasons that nobody understands, uh, it's really quite puzzling, it disappeared. Uh, we should be so lucky this time, but we're not going to be. Uh, th there were uh, some unique features that may have led it to disappear, but it's gone. The other one is in the Middle East, uh, and uh, that's called MIRS. Uh, for Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, MERS-CoV. Uh, it was uh, a camel organism. Actually, uh, being close to camels, caring for camels is a risk factor, but it's also transmissible from person to person. And you may know it jumped uh, to South Korea at one point. Uh, so it had the, the potential to become an international threat, but never became a pandemic, in part because it's not as contagious. Uh, as uh, what we have now, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, or COVID-19. So COVID-19 is novel because it is a, um, a very contagious virus. It's uh, become a pandemic, which means it's spread globally. I know there were lots of arguments at WHO and vilification of WHO for not declaring it a pandemic earlier. It's a technical definition of a, how widely spread it is in the world. It's a pandemic. Uh, but it, it's novelties. It's very contagious and it's uh, probably more lethal. What is more lethal than, let's say, influenza, but not as lethal as SARS, which was, had a very high mortality rate. It's extremely bad uh, organism to acquire. So these are novel. They're, they're genetically distinct. Uh, coronaviruses are what are called RNA viruses for ribonucleic acid. Uh, and they basically, for those of you who are interested in the biology, uh, they invade human cells in the respiratory tract and hijack the genetic machinery of those cells to make more virus, which eventually erupt from the cell in the millions and invade uh, other cells. So they basically are messenger RNA that makes the proteins uh, for the virus to replicate and, uh, and spread in the body. So what, uh, what makes it so contagious or what, what, what causes a virus to become a pandemic? Yeah, so it, it, has to be, uh, it has to be contagious, and you've asked the right question. Uh, we actually don't know exactly how many viral particles you need to cause an infection, but it doesn't seem like it's a great number. So it, there are multiple instances where people have had parties or dinners or meetings, and half the people or so have become infected. So it's clearly very contagious. And one of the reasons that it's problematic is that you're contagious before you have the symptoms of a cough or other uh, fever or whatever, uh, so that you can be unsuspectingly spreading the infection to your neighbor um, before you're even sick. And some people never get sick. Uh, they just don't have symptoms at all, and yet they're contagious. The virus reaches very high levels in the nasopharynx, the area between the nose and the throat. Uh, and every time you cough or you sneeze, or if you talk forcefully like I'm doing now, if I say a letter P, uh, if you looked at my screen here, you'd probably see little flecks from the droplets that I'm generating. So very contagious. And of course, these days, uh, the transmission globally is far easier than it was uh, before we had international trade and air travel and so forth. So uh, what happens in Brazil or what happens in uh, in this case, Wuhan, uh, can have immediate impact. If you look at the uh, animated diagrams of spread from Wuhan, just tracking how people disseminate themselves first in China, but very, very quickly to other parts of Asia and eventually to the whole world, you can see uh, how, how this uh, actually happened. The, the virus itself probably is a bat virus. Uh, it's interesting, bats seem to be the, uh, uh, the uh, species that harbors a lot of viruses that eventually get to man. And, and it's a complicated picture, but the bats don't get sick. And they live in a kind of balance with these viruses. And uh, the bats either infect man directly or can infect an intermediate host like with SARS. Uh, 
was a civet cat that was sold in uh, markets uh, in parts of China. Um, uh, so that's where the virus comes from. It has to adapt itself to be both pathogenic to cause disease in humans and to spread from human to human. A lot of viruses don't do that well. So bird flu, we've heard a lot about bird flu, these very dangerous influenza strains. In general, they've not been able to adapt themselves well to both infect humans and then to have humans infect other humans. Most of those cases have been people who take care of poultry, for example, and are directly exposed to the birds that have the flu. So the virus has to adapt to humans to cause disease, has to adapt to humans to spread from human to human, and then it has to be highly infectious and its spread is enabled by air travel and international commerce. Hmm. Uh, so following up, so you mentioned that the virus may spread through the little spit droplets from when you speak and then it'll land on surfaces. If I, let's say a uh, infected person sneezes in a room and then I walk into that room an hour later, am I at risk if I don't touch anything? Yeah, so this is really interesting. There's a lot of debate about this. With SARS, which is after all, remember, uh, SARS is SARS-CoV-1, um, there was a fair amount of evidence that it was a truly airborne uh, organism as well as being spread by these large droplets. So. Uh, just to explain that a little bit, when I'm saying P, I'm making large droplets and they will fall to the ground or the table uh, within about six feet, give or take a couple of feet. However, I'm also producing much smaller uh, particles or droplets. And these are small, for those of you measuring microns, there are a few microns in size, and they'll waft on the air currents all through this room here and they can linger. Uh, with SARS, that really did happen. In fact, it was for uh, kind of unique reasons. It was very highly concentrated, not just here, but also in feces. And so in the Amoy uh, apartment complex where the SARS spread uh, very widely, it was actually being, uh, people were having uh, bowel movements. And then if you know how toilets work, there's a shaft or a, a pipe that goes up to the roof of the building where the gas gets expelled so you don't have an explosion in your house. I mean, that's basically what happens. And the uh, virus went up those pipes and spread from the roof of the building on the other buildings and into air conditioning units. So uh, the question is, does that happen with SARS-CoV-2, with COVID-19? And I think that maybe it does under some circumstances. In general, uh, if you walked into that room uh, an hour later, I think you're okay if you don't touch anything. But there may be some people who, for reasons that we don't fully understand, create many more of these very small droplets. And, and you probably have a minimal but definite chance in some circumstances of acquiring it that way. Hmm. The so classic virus, by the way, where that happens is measles. Uh, measles virus will stay in the air for three hours. If you have a kid come into a doctor's office with measles and another kid comes in three hours later who hasn't had the vaccine, they'll get sick. So very, very contagious. Uh, there was an epidemic in a uh, kind of a Superdome in Minneapolis with Dome Stadium, where a Special Olympian uh, was marching uh, down on the track in the opening ceremonies and somebody 30 meters above uh, got measles uh, from that kid. It's very contagious, very much airborne. Uh, this COVID-19 virus, probably not so much, but it could happen. You mentioned how viruses have to mutate to spread from person to person, um, which brings me to our first uh, student question. Greetings to everyone. My name is Georgina Fakukaki, and um, I'm currently pursuing a gap year in Puerto Rico, where I teach design thinking and public education. How does the virus mutate or alter from person to person? Um, RNA viruses like this uh, virus we're talking about now mutate all the time. Uh, they, uh, they tend to mutate more than other kinds of viruses, actually. So far, all of the mutations that have occurred are really, really minor. Uh, it's kind of one gene, one protein, very minor. But we, using uh, sophisticated uh, sequencing of the gene, can now track these mutations over time and from place to place. So uh, there are several, maybe many, many types of uh, 
this virus that have mutated, but they're not more infectious. They're not more dangerous. They're not less dangerous. So the mutations so far have been just something we can detect, but they're not of any consequence in terms of the threat of the virus. Everybody worries that the virus will have a major mutation and that the vaccine we develop may then not be effective. Uh, I would right. hope the virus has a major mutation and disappears off the face of the earth because it's no longer infectious. So far, we have no evidence of that whatsoever, uh, even though we've seen many, many infections and the virus replicates many, many times in any uh, given human being. But it's a great question. Uh, we do have another question from a student about how viruses spread and the things that may affect them. Hello, everyone. My name is Darren Andini. I am a senior at Rivermont Collegiate in Bettendorf, Iowa. Do certain weather patterns decrease the effectiveness or rapid transmission of the virus? That's a really important question and it's been extremely controversial. So some viruses like uh, influenza are seasonal. Uh, they uh, come during the colder months and they tend to wane or almost disappear during the warmer months. Uh, although this type of virus, the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, uh, has some variation in how vigorous and how fat well it grows depending on humidity and temperature, that's not going to be a major factor. So we're having massive epidemics where it's quite warm and quite humid. Uh, and we're seeing uh, the spread in parts of the world where it's still pretty cool and uh, early spring or late winter. So these climatologic factors, although theoretically important, aren't going to make a big difference here. What happens in the summer, regardless of what the virus does, is we tend to socially distance because we're outside more. Uh, when it's cold and wintry or very, very rainy or whatever, we're congregated indoors. Uh, when the sun shines like it is today here, uh, as soon as I'm off this call, I'll be outside and automatically socially distancing. So that'll be a factor, but it's not because the virus um, cares that much whether it's warm or cold out. All right, thank you. So um, you've mentioned you're a big fan of history. Uh, and of course, there have been a number of noteworthy pandemics throughout history. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about them and how COVID-19 may differ from them. Well, I, I, I'd love to talk about the bubonic plague or the so-called Black Death. Um, it's just such a cool infection, right? It, by the way, it's still around. Uh, there is plague, the organism uh, Yersinia pestis, present wherever you live, unless you're in Australia. So if you're in China, uh, in the animal kingdom, we call this sylvatic for in the forest or in the environment, there are animals running around with plague, uh, mainly rats, but also other animals. So uh, some poor guy, a hunter, uh, in outer Mongolia, uh, killed and ate a rabbit that happened to be infected with plague in, uh, just a year ago, and three people ended up with plague, and, and folks thought the world was going to come to an end, but it didn't really spread. So we always have a little plague around. Uh, interestingly, and this uh, is kind of a cool anecdote, in Russia, where they had first denied they had any plague, but now it's, uh, uh, they, I'm sorry, where they first denied they didn't have any uh, COVID, uh, it turns out the people who are now doing surveillance to find cases of COVID-19 are the plague epidemiologists. They still have a whole network of people who are looking for cases of plague in Russia, and they're the sleuths who are going out trying to find cases. So plague's still around, but not epidemic. Uh, back in uh, uh, earlier times, the time of Justinian and the Byzantine Empire, the first pandemic of plague occurred. Uh, and I'm not going to really uh, uh, talk much about that, but rather focus on the one we all read about in history books, the Black Death, the plague of 1348 uh, and subsequent years that uh, even after that first wave reappeared and reappeared uh, all the way through the 17th century, especially in Europe. That plague came somewhere from the steppes uh, uh, near China uh, and spread to a port called Kaffa which is in modern day uh, Ukraine. Uh, and that was a trading place where people bartered furs from the Don River in Russia and silks from Asia and spices. And it was a great trade port with, with many, many ships in harbor. Uh, the Mongols 
uh, if you studied uh, Marco Polo and Kublai Khan and those things, the Mongols laid siege to Kaffa and they used these uh, sling-like machines to throw plague bodies into the city, thereby uh, starting an epidemic. Those are the first biological warfare. Uh, the plague's been used, by the way, in biological warfare subsequently. The Japanese in World War II dropped uh, a plague on Chinese cities trying to start an epidemic. Uh, General Ishii was the guy's name who perpetrated that atrocity. Uh, but anyway, once it was in Kaffa, those ships then went to Europe to southern France and Italy, and uh, the rats bred uh, the plague uh, were on those ships. And so the ships stopped, the rats run out and start infecting people in these crowded port cities where the sanitation wasn't very good and there was lots of opportunity for the rats to, to uh, thrive. But by the way, rats multiply so fast that there'd be millions and millions of rats if we didn't do something to contain them. They're unbelievable. A rat can fall 50 feet and be perfectly intact. It, it can go through adobe brick uh, and, call, and, and get into your house. Uh, it, it, it plans its escape routes. Uh, they're amazing animals. And, and, and how do rats spread the plague? They have fleas. And the fleas from the rats jump onto us uh, and uh, take a blood meal. Uh, it turns out when a, when a flea uh, takes a blood meal that has plague in it, its foregut gets all clogged up with the plague that multiply here. And then when it bites the human being, it disgorges like a hypodermic needle uh, the uh, plague uh, bacteria into the bloodstream causing plague in the human being. Anyway, that's probably more detailed than you're interested in, but it's, it's cool. Uh, and uh, uh, the plague spread throughout Europe uh, over subsequent uh, years, uh, just really two or three, and killed a third or more of the population of Europe. Uh, so just imagine that. We're talking here about a lot of deaths with COVID-19. This is a third of the population. So this is why people, when they hear pandemic, they immediately think plague. And when they think of plague, they think the world's going to end. And it almost did. I mean, it was really, really catastrophic. In those days, of course, nobody had any idea of what caused the plague. They thought it was due to what we, what we call miasmas. Miasmas are foul vapors that come from rotting material, carcasses of animals, uh, feces, uh, dirty, dirty rivers. And we smell it, and in those days they thought, oh, that's what's causing disease, these miasmas. And they'd actually wear masks with beaks that had herbs in them so that they figured if we don't smell it, we're not going to catch it. So they didn't know that rats were causing it, that fleas were causing it, that bacteria existed. Yet they understood that people were transmitting it, and they took public health measures that today look very modern. Uh, I, I like to refer to the uh, city-state of Venice, which was, as you know, a very prosperous place in uh, Italy, a, a great center of trade. If you look at the public health uh, regimen that was adopted there, it looks very much like what we're doing in New York City. They had uh, uh, what we call command and control. Somebody was in charge. Somebody was setting the policy and the orders. They banned all uh, congregation of people. Uh, you couldn't even go to church. You couldn't have a procession. Uh, they didn't want people to be depressed, so they banned them wearing morning clothes out in the streets. Uh, they closed the bars and places of ill repute so that people wouldn't uh, congregate there. And by the way, they thought sinning probably brought this on as well. Uh, they, 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 they had a quarantine on the ships. Uh, any ship coming in a port couldn't come in until it was inspected and all the food was inspected and it was kept out there for a period of time. In fact, the word quarantine comes from that era of uh, creating a zone of safety uh, around your city. Uh, they had infectious disease hospitals. They built, just like in New York City, special hospitals with a plague uh, called lazarettos or plague houses. Uh, they, they marked houses where people were uh, had the plague. They disposed of bodies in a certain way so people wouldn't get infected. For people that didn't know the germ theory, this is pretty darn good. Uh, and the lessons of public health remain today exactly what they were then. Quarantine is important. Distance is important. How you handle infected materials, what you do with corpses, uh, how you deal with uh, the moral uplifting of the people. You, you know, the doge could either be uh, somebody that spread doom and gloom and, and uh, chaos because of inconsistent messaging, or it could be somebody that uplifted the people and said, we're in it together. And you see that tension here in the United States now where communication um, is sometimes, I, I think, confusing, chaotic, uh, 
uh, the language is used that nobody can understand. What the heck is syndromic surveillance? What is cytokine storm? People don't know what that is. So uh, in Venice, they understood how to message. So we've learned a lot from, uh, from that uh, plague. There was a later pandemic that I want to briefly mention uh, called the Barbary Plague or the third pandemic uh, that spread again from Asia uh, and came to the United States via uh, Hawaii. Uh, and uh, when it came to the United States on a ship called the Nippon Maru, I believe in 1900, it caused an outbreak of plague in the Chinese quarter uh, of San Francisco. Uh, and uh, at first, as we see in some places now, people denied its existence. Uh, they said it was a farce. It was fake news in the terminology of the time. They used other words, uh, but the press denied it. The governor denied it. The people in the Chinese community denied it because they were uh, dependent on the business of people coming into the Chinese quarter to eat or uh, buy things or whatever. Uh, but there was plague. Uh, in, uh, in the Chinese uh, district. This was a time uh, in, in the United States where Chinese people were regarded as second class. Uh, it was a time of exclusion uh, statutes. It was a time when Chinese uh, laborers built the Transcontinental uh, Railroad under excruciatingly awful conditions. So it wasn't a time where people uh, really respected uh, Chinese uh, folks and they were quick to blame them and, and to uh, cordon off uh, the Chinese area once they determined that actually there was plague there. In fact, in Honolulu, they burned the whole Chinese quarter down because they thought that would be a good way to get rid of the, of the plague in Honolulu. So uh, there are a lot of lessons, uh, lessons about public health, lessons about stigma and prejudice, uh, lessons about economic impact, uh, lessons about covering up versus making known uh, that are just as relevant today as they were in the great pandemics of the Black Death. Hmm. Uh, another pandemic that we've been hearing a lot about in the news is the uh, the 1918 uh, flu pandemic. And I'll let another student uh, ask you a question about that. Hi, my name is Nina and I'm from Taiwan. Since a lot of people compare coronavirus with the Spanish flu in 1918, um, in what ways do this coronavirus and the Spanish flu uh, differentiate from each other and how are they similar to each other and what are the lessons that we can learn from the Spanish flu to prevent us from getting more severe? Thank you for answering my question. Great. Well, thank you, Nina. That's a terrific uh, question. Uh, you know, first of all, I'll just notice that you call it the Spanish flu, which is what people often call it, even though it did not originate in Spain. Uh, and uh, historically, whenever there's an epidemic or something terrible, people want to blame it on another country. So uh, when syphilis came to Europe, um, every country called it somebody else's disease, the French disease, the Italian disease. So uh, the Spanish flu had really nothing specific to do with, with Spain, just for the record. Uh, it was a very lethal infection. We have not seen a strain or a type of influenza to rival that uh, since. Uh, and it, in fact, there's a lot of controversy about laboratories that are experimenting with that strain now that we've been able to um, actually isolate it. Um, and uh, we don't want it to get loose again because it's so lethal. Unlike the current um, virus, uh, it uh, attacked mainly younger people. And the reason for that probably was that old folks like me even though it was not recorded anywhere in the scientific record, had been exposed to a relatively similar uh, type of influenza when we were young. Uh, it wasn't as lethal or severe, but we had antibody, we had some immunity. So the old folks didn't have as nearly what uh, uh, the young people experienced. The, the full-blooded young men and women were just dropping over, turning blue from this influenza due to horrible pneumonia. In addition, we didn't have antibiotics then. And sometimes people who have viral pneumonia, like with influenza, get a secondary infection with bacteria like staph, you're probably familiar with, or pneumococcus or strep, and that killed a lot of people. So they would initially get better and then they would succumb to the bacteri bacterial infection. Uh, so, but that is influenza, it's a different kind of virus. Uh, and uh, coronavirus is different. So we wanna be careful not to uh, make virological uh, comparisons between the two because they're really different. 
what we can talk about is the impact on society and the economy, the fear, the panic, the blaming, uh, and the lessons we learned mainly from that uh, epidemic or pandemic about social distancing. That's where this idea of social distancing came from because it turned out uh, that places that imposed those restrictions uh, relatively early were spared the, <coughs> spared the full brunt of the influenza. In fact, there were towns that walled themselves off, basically. They didn't allow people in, they quarantined, uh, and they didn't have uh, nearly the impact of influenza that we have. Uh, so uh, I guess the main lessons are, uh, how does the world react when something clearly very lethal is going around? Uh, and uh, what have we learned about uh, uh, social distancing control to try and uh, stem the spread? Remember, that was also wartime. Uh, and a lot of the problems that occurred were due to the movement of troops uh, to Europe and, and so forth. So that was a complicating factor then. Hmm. So I got a number of follow-up questions to that. Um, so I guess the one that encompasses it all is what questions are we still trying to answer about COVID-19 or about SARS-CoV-2? Well, we, we are still trying to figure out exactly how it causes disease, but I think we're getting there already. Uh, we, we know what cells it invades. We know that unlike uh, other viruses of its type, uh, it replicates really quickly and the highest night number or tighter concentration of viruses very early uh, in the disease, in fact, before symptoms in some people. Uh, we also know that having reached that high peak, it lingers for uh, probably 14 days or longer in people who've been infected. And that makes it hard to know when you can release them to the community. So, you know, you said, uh, I think that you knew somebody uh, who has uh, this virus, and the question is going to be, well, when is she going to be comfortable? When are you going to be comfortable letting her out of her uh, self-imposed uh, quarantine? So we're still learning about that. Uh, we're learning more about the uh, impact in children. Uh, children don't seem to get sick, but the reason we close the schools is that we uh, know that although they're not really seriously ill, usually, uh, they still can be infected with low-grade symptoms and then spread amongst themselves, <clears throat> and then they come home and infect grandma. So that's an area that we're trying to uh, learn more about. Uh, ultimately, we want to understand what there is about the virus that can serve as a target for treatment and for the development of vaccines. And um, uh, I can tell you one thing about the virus we've discovered already. You know, it's amazing how quickly we learn uh, in science these days. Uh, when, when I was young, what we're doing now wouldn't have been done in years, let alone in weeks. I mean, within weeks, we had the sequence of the virus. We were able to take that uh, sequence of the genetic material and begin to think about vaccines. We knew that it had a special protein called a spike protein that sticks out of the coronavirus. And we know it attaches to something called an ACE2 inhibitor on the cells of the respiratory tract. And we know how it invades. I mean, it's amazing what we know uh, about this virus already. Uh, but that doesn't mean we can easily translate that into diagnostic tests, vaccines, and uh, drug treatments. Hmm. So before we get to uh vaccines and treatments, uh, I do want to spend a little bit more time on testing, because uh, that does seem to be a key factor in uh, what will help us uh, return to some sense of normal. Um, I've seen headlines in the past couple of days that one of the main rapid tests uh, may be producing as high as 15% uh, false negatives. Um, so uh, to actually ask the question, I'm going to turn to Betty Bao from Xiaomen University in China. Hello everyone, my name is Bao Zhuo Fan, but you can also call me Betty. I'm from China. I'm currently studying German in Xiamen University as a sophomore. Due to the inaccuracy of the present way of testing, is there clinically a better way of testing COVID-19 and identify those patients, especially those without symptoms? That would be all. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Betty, and it's a great pleasure to speak to somebody from China, I had the great pleasure of visiting five cities in China not too many years ago to give um, talks at uh, universities uh, there. Uh, 
Uh, in fact, I was in Wuhan, uh, which I understand is called the furnace of China. It's extremely hot when I was there. It was about 104 degrees uh, Fahrenheit as I climbed the steps of the Yellow Tower. Uh, and I've uh, been to China enough times to see how uh, Shanghai uh, went from having uh, uh, nothing uh, uh, except a field that, uh, where now it's Pudong. So uh, it's, it's great to have your question. So diagnostic testing is really going to be uh, critical here, especially uh, testing for uh, the virus itself, which is, I think, what you're asking about, but also for immunity or antibody to the virus. So um, let's talk first about testing for the virus. The main way this is done is through polymerase chain reaction type testing that actually detect the genetic material of the uh, virus, the RNA, the ribonucleic acid. Uh, and the uh, gold standard, the best test right now that we have is a nasopharyngeal swab that's to go up through your nose and down your throat and it's very uncomfortable. Uh, and um, uh, also produces a lot of aerosols of virus because people cough right in your face and you have to be properly protected with a face shield and a mask. Uh, so, but, but that's what gets, gets the most accurate results. It's the most sensitive test in that you don't have false negatives. That said, even that test has problems. That if, the, if the sample isn't taken correctly by the person taking it, uh, then your chance of finding the virus are diminished. If the person is either very early, very, very early, or very late in the infection, the concentration of virus in the nasopharynx is lower and the test may miss it. That's why you hear some people who are negative by test and then they turn positive. Well, are they reinfected? Probably not. They probably have low levels of virus that was just missed by the test uh, when it was done and now the test is picking it up. The easier you make this test, for rapid use uh, by uh, healthcare people or for self-administration at home, the more you tend to sacrifice the sensitivity of that test as a screening test. When you have a screening test, you wanna find out is somebody infectious or not? You don't wanna have falsely negative tests. That's a disaster. Uh, and uh, we're already seeing that one of the very popular rapid tests may not be uh, as sensitive as we hoped it would be, that there are false negatives. Uh, and uh, we now have a home kit that you can take the test yourself, but it's not this nasopharyngeal awkward test. It's done through the mouth. And uh, I, I will see how sensitive that is. It, it's not gonna be as good as the more formal test that I mentioned. So there are trade-offs, uh, but I can tell you one thing, if we don't get better testing, uh, and approach what, let's say, South Korea has done, which is quite uh, amazing. Um, at least in the United States, we're not going to get back to normal anytime soon. So let's put aside false negatives for a second. Um, if someone has still has the virus in them or is recovering, um, has a low enough level that they test negative, is there a risk that they're still contagious? Yeah, so that's a good question. Under the right circumstances, probably. So, uh, so let's let's just say that um, I blow my nose because I still, or I, I sneeze because I still have some residual symptoms, even though I'm really better. I mean, when you have pneumonia, you're going to cough for weeks, right? And so I I uh, cough into my hand because I'm sloppy. I don't do it this way. And even if I do it this way, my sweater's all snotty. So but you're a professor of immunology. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. You know, I was on a, I, uh, just so the students know, I was on a call and uh, the guy on the other end coughed in his hand and, and I was going to say something, but I said, oh, I don't want to embarrass him. And then five minutes later, I coughed into my hand. So these are, these are habits that are hard to break. But if, if I did that, and then I shook hands with you, and you touch your eyes or your nose, even if I have low titer of virus, low concentration, I think that that's a threat. Obviously, the fewer viruses you have in, in your spit, uh, then the lower the risk. So we've talked about uh, diagnostic testing, uh, but I've also been seeing articles about uh, antibody testing. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what that is. Yeah, so um, antibody testing is merely a way to detect uh, the human body's immune response to the virus. And in general, if I have influenza, uh, 
I will make antibodies to the influenza that will protect me against future infection by that specific type of influenza. Or uh, once I have measles, I'm not gonna get measles again, I'm, I'm immune to measles. Uh, and so with this virus, you'd like to be able to know when people have made antibody that will protect them so they can get about their work, and go, back, go back into normal society. Um, the problem is that we really don't know how protective that antibody is yet. Uh, you know, people who get influenza vaccine will know that every year they get vaccinated again because the immunity from that vaccine doesn't last very long. And even with natural infection with influenza, it's probably not really strong immunity for your lifetime. And we don't know at all for SARS-CoV-2 how long that immunity lasts and how strong that immunity is. There's some suggestion already that the milder your illness, the more likely you are to have low levels of antibody that will protect you for a very long time. Uh, and that's one problem. Uh, and the other is that the antibody test has to be a really good test. There, um, without getting too technical about it, there are two types of antibody you make. Uh, one is called IgM and the other is called IgG. Uh, this is important because the IgM comes up very fast. So if you get uh, you know, COVID-19 um, uh, in the next few days, within a few more days, maybe a week uh, or so, you will have IgM antibodies present in your bloodstream. And we can measure those and we can say, wow, you have either got COVID-19 now or you had it very recently. And then we can test you further and work you up. The problem with that test is that historically, most of those IgM tests have a lot of false positives. So I could say, well, you're IgM positive, you may be infected or you, whatever, and it could be a false positive and just wrong. Uh, and we're almost certainly gonna see that problem. The IgG test is easier to do and more reliable. That comes up later, usually after a week or two. And when that comes up, usually the virus begins to disappear because the antibody binds to the virus and then it can be cleared by the, from the body. It's called neutralizing antibody for that reason, neutralizes the virus. Uh, and the tests for that are, are pretty good. So if you have a positive test for the IgG, uh, I, I think you'll be immune, at least in the short term. The question of how long and how strong that immunity is, we just don't know. So one of the most important steps uh, that I've been hearing about in terms of prevention and return to normalcy is the development of a vaccine. Uh, so I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about vaccines uh, and what it takes to develop them. Yeah, so uh, everybody listening, uh, wherever you are, have probably been immunized against certain uh, uh, organisms, viruses and bacteria. You almost certainly uh, had a immunization against mumps, rubella and measles, uh, you probably have been, been immunized against a whooping cough. Uh, you've been immunized against a polio, most likely, and diphtheria, and uh, various bacteria like pneumococcus and, and so forth. So you've all had vaccines, and the reason you get them is that they produce antibodies reliably because they're good vaccines and protect you against disease for uh, some or most of, of uh, your lifetime. So. The goal here is to create a vaccine that we can use to protect against uh, SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, the key here is to identify something called uh, an antigen, and that's an important technical term if you're not familiar with it. An antigen comes from uh, antibody generating, antigen antibody, antibody generating. So you want to have a substance or a protein or something on the surface or part of the virus that will serve as an antibody generating antigen. So I've already mentioned one, if you've been paying close attention, I talked about the spike protein, the, the spike on the coronavirus, that's a protein that attaches to a receptor on the epithelial cell. If you can make that into an antigen and put it in a vaccine, and get it to produce antibodies in a human being, well, maybe those antibodies will attach to that spike protein and prevent the virus from attaching to the receptor and invading a cell, in essence, neutralizing it. So I, I hope that's pretty clear. The, the question is, uh, how do you do that? 
um, you have to have, first of all, an antigen that you can easily produce in the laboratory and put in a vaccine. It's got to be safe. Um, it's got to produce an immune response and almost everybody gets it. Now, at my age, an influenza vaccine, for example, is only about 20 to 25 percent effective. I've got to take a super duper dose of that vaccine to get an antibody response in the hope I'll be protected. Uh, there are a lot of old people here who are very vulnerable to COVID-19. That vaccine better produce neutralizing antibody in old people. Otherwise, it's not going to save a lot of lives, right? So um, those are the challenges. There are at least um, 20 or more uh, vaccines under development in the world now. Uh, one of the most important things we need to foster is collaboration. I mean, every time I see a leader in the United States trashing some other country or saying things about another country, I'm saying, well, what if they're the country that invents the vaccine that will save our skin, right? So uh, I know that this organization where I'm talking for today is all about collaboration. Well, this is where world collaboration is absolutely imperative because I don't know who the winner is going to be. The United States main vaccine candidate is actually a, 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 a platform for making vaccines that's never been used to make an approved vaccine. Uh, they're basically taking um, RNA, messenger RNA, uh, that they hope will target through nanoparticles the immune cells in my body, and then I'll generate the right antibody to fight the virus. Well, that, that's never been incorporated in an approved vaccine as far as I know. So it, the, the nice thing about it is it's easy to scale. It, once you get that down, you can make millions of doses relatively easy. That's why they're doing it. Other people are just gonna be trying to isolate that spike protein and fashioning it with some sort of vaccine that will produce antibody. To do that, you've gotta usually add something called an adjuvant, that makes sense, adjuvant, uh, that will boost the immune response. But that's another tip. So all these uh, companies and governments have different approaches. Once somebody actually gets a vaccine that, let's say, works in the laboratory and then works in some animal, uh, then we got a safety test it in humans, and that's what's starting now. It's called phase one trials. The whole point of that is to come up with uh, some notion of whether that vaccine is safe. This is not trivial. Some vaccines in history have not been safe. So uh, people are very worried about dengue fever vaccine. If you're familiar with dengue, if you live in the Caribbean or in Asia, you're familiar with dengue. That vaccine actually paradoxically produces antibodies that are enhancing for the disease. And I'm not gonna go into why that is, it's the wrong antibodies produced to that vaccine. And, and it's now very controversial and dangerous actually uh, uh, to use some of those older vaccines. So we don't wanna make that mistake now. If we're gonna rapidly immunize, let's say 300 million people in the United States or a billion people in wherever you live, uh, we can't afford that vaccine to be 95% safe and have 5% of the population with severe sequelae. So getting past that phase one is a big hurdle. Uh, and then you've got to do clinical trials to show that it actually works. Uh, the most massive clinical trial I'm aware of was with polio vaccine, the Salk vaccine, which you probably all had. Uh, we immunized hundreds of thousands of school children in the United States to determine whether that vaccine was better than no vaccine at all. And it's a, you can look it up on the internet. It's absolutely fascinating. And within less than a year, once we had the vaccine, we determined that that vaccine worked. Well, that's great. Then you have to scale it up uh, so that you can have it for the whole world. And that's a huge manufacturing challenge. In fact, with the polio vaccine, and God willing, it will not happen again, one of the companies did not inactivate the, vi the uh, polio virus sufficiently and there were thousands of cases of paralytic polio produced by the vaccine that was manufactured without good quality control. We're better off today, but you can imagine in the haste to get everybody immunized to protect Don Goldman and his elderly ilk from uh, COVID-19, uh, there could be some shortcuts and shortcuts will kill people. Hmm. Uh, so uh, to follow up on that, I do want to turn over to another student question. Hi. My name is Bernal Dembry and I'm from Revere, Massachusetts. How accessible do you think COVID-19 vaccines will be to the general public? Yeah, how accessible will they be? Well, I've already talked about the problems of scaling up the production. Then the question is, how do you get them in people um, it, what, all over the world? And I, I got to make a little side comment here. Uh, you, you know, 
equity and social justice are really, really important. Uh, when I was on a uh, call with the NIH here in the United States, uh, I asked uh, what's going to happen in Africa. Are they going to get the vaccine? Are people living uh, in Sierra Leone going to get the vaccine? Are people in the United States uh, living in the inner city of Detroit going to get the vaccine? How are they going to get to the place where the vaccine is given? I mean, there are enormous global disparities and local disparities in access to care and who gets what. So that's the main point I, I want to make. Uh, it's going to be logistically difficult in an equitable system to get to everybody. It's going to be logistically very difficult to get everybody in an inequitable system. So depending on where you live and what your health system is like uh, and how much they consider social justice a priority, that'll depend on whether everybody who deserves the vaccine actually gets it. Uh, actually, I want to get your two cents on an article I read this morning that African-American communities are being impacted more heavily from what I'm seeing. Um, and this article makes the argument that more vulnerable populations, um, by the fact that they're more vulnerable, by the fact that they face more stress in their day-to-day -day lives, may have more compromised immune systems. Um, do you have thoughts on that? So it is absolutely obvious, and it was predictable, that people of color brown and black people, and especially African Americans and uh, indigenous peoples, Native Americans, would be uh, more severely impacted. I mean, why would it be different than any other aspect of the healthcare system in the United States? And now we're seeing uh, that these uh, people are much more adversely impacted than, let's say, white Americans uh, are. Uh, and that's probably true wherever you are. It depends on the population, what the circumstances are. Disparities are ubiquitous. You asked a very good question. Uh, there's a technical term for this called allostatic load. The amount of stress that you undergo just by being treated badly uh, all your life, by being subjected to uh, prejudice and discrimination and living in uh, as a stressful environment, that does impact your immune system. But even more than that, the populations we're talking about for a whole variety of structural reasons and policy reasons have a higher level of predisposing conditions like uh, severe overweight or obesity, diabetes, hypertension. Uh, th these are enormous problems that are differentially occurring in people who are poor and people who are uh, black uh, in the United States. So uh, you've raised a, a really important issue that we're going to uh, have to address. Um, it, we're not going to, in a day, undo all the issues around structural racism in the United States, we, uh, repair all the social inequities, or deal with all the social determinants and physical determinants of being more susceptible. But one thing we can do is to do everything in our power to make sure they have the same access and ability to be immunized as everybody else. And just as importantly, we've got to talk in a way that includes them. So I'll be honest, when I see people at our uh, White House briefings using the language they use, people don't understand. People who are poor, who don't have high level of health literacy, they just don't understand what that's being talked about. Uh, and you got to message them. I mean, to say, go wear a mask to young black man living in inner city um, uh, Detroit, uh, go wear a mask in public. Are you, uh, he's going to say, are you kidding me? I'm going to go out with a mask in public and somebody's going to pull me over. So, uh, you know, nobody seems to, well, um, pe some people are, but people when they talk from leadership positions in whatever country you're in, have got to talk in a way that includes everybody under their umbrella. Thank you for touching on such an important topic. Um, so one more follow-up question about vaccines and then we'll wrap things up. Uh, so we got one more student question. Hello, my name is Reese. I come from Chapel Hill, North Carolina in the United States. Mostly I was wondering if uh, a vaccine is the only viable solution to this problem or if there are other methods that could bring us back to some level of normalcy. Thanks. Okay, well, there's a Tar Heel, I think, that's uh, asking that question. So thank you. Really good question. So it does uh, bring up the possibility of a prophylactic or preventative drug. Uh, I, I don't think the social distancing and all these kinds of things we're doing now are going to end it. Uh, so the question is, how can you protect people en masse? Well, uh, there was this, I think, false hope that 
uh, hydroxychloroquine, the malaria, malaria drug, uh, could be something that people could take. And it, it, it's not looking so great for hydroxychloroquine. And the other drug that we have in the pipeline called remdesivir is an intravenous drug that is for critically ill patients and isn't suitable for mass administration. So having a simple pill that people could take uh, when COVID sweeps through their community is, uh, would be great if we had it. Uh, but we we uh, actually don't have anything like that yet uh, in the uh, pipeline. So I think the best hope is actually a vaccine uh, for a general protection of a population. So how long should we expect COVID-19 to be with us? Um, we just discussed what it would take for a full recovery, um, but what do you think a realistic goal is in the next couple of years? Yeah, so... Uh, there's one uh, school of thought, which I think is correct, uh, that it will become part of our repertoire of viruses that circulate in the community and wax and wane and carry a certain level of severe infection and mortality. Uh, and uh, maybe it'll become sort of like influenza uh, that we live with uh, and we understand that pe some people are going to die and the season will come and it will sweep through and then it will abate somewhat. Uh, so it, it just could become part of the fabric of the viruses we live with and worry about, but perhaps a little bit more severe than others. Uh, a vaccine would fundamentally change that, right? It would get us to a point where if people get vaccinated, they're going to be protected. Uh, but short of that, at least until we have a vaccine for the next 12 or 18 or 24 months, uh, we can anticipate waves of infection. I mean, we can loosen up and get back to something like uh, semblance of normal. But the, if the virus is still there, which I think it will be, it'll continue to break out. The, the way to deal with that is to have a dual mindset. First, uh, if the level of disease gets to a certain lower level, then you can actually, if you have good testing, identify people who are infected, isolate them, do contact tracing, and contain. We've gone beyond that now in the United States for the current time because we don't have that level of testing. There are too many infected patients, but we could get back to that level. So that's one mindset is we're, th this is going to happen and we're going to just jump all over it and prevent it from becoming a big deal. Secondly, you have to say, well, what is the tolerable level of background disease? As I was just saying, we live with uh, risk all the time. I, I, I'm at risk every time I drive a car. Uh, I'm at risk even if I get flu vaccine because it's, uh, it's not perfect. What can society accept as a reasonable level of risk and get back to something resembling normality? Absolute safety, which is what a lot of American people seem to think they're entitled to, is impossible. Uh, and I don't like it when people say, well, your chances of dying in a car accident are just as great as dying. Well, that's not relevant because car accidents are not an infectious disease. Uh, and so it's a bad analogy. But the fact is we live with all kinds of risks. Every time I walk out of this place, like I, I'm deciding whether I wanna buy rabbit fencing to protect my vegetables I'm trying to grow so I can self-sustain myself through this crisis. In order to get that rabbit fencing, I probably am gonna to have to go into the place that sells it because they don't seem willing to deliver the rabbit fencing. I'm gonna make a calculated decision. How much risk am I willing as an individual to take? And society will have to calibrate what risk is society are we willing to tolerate? What degree of illness and death is uh, tolerable if not desirable? All right, well, thank you for, uh, for being straight with us. Um, I think it's important for us to have realistic, a realistic understanding of what our future may look like. Um, hope is vital and keeps us going, um, but understanding exactly the challenges that we're gonna have to navigate are, are really helpful. Um, so Don, I really wanna thank you so much uh, for taking the time to share your expertise with us today. It's been fascinating and very informative. Um, and so before we sign off, I just wanted to know if you have any additional things you'd like to share with our student community, any parting thoughts or words of wisdom? Well, it is kind of a little bit uh, uh, maudlin, I guess. But uh, I mean, there's no greater, actually, honor and privilege than to teach uh, people at uh, the high school level or, for that matter, college level. Um, I recently was on a panel that was advising parents how to discuss 
COVID-19 with younger children, uh, people who are in elementary school. And I think that it's a fabulous opportunity to talk seriously about things of consequence uh, with children uh, and young adults, uh, regardless of their age or their background, uh, because this is a learning opportunity for everybody here. We're all gonna be smarter because of it. We're gonna talk about things we normally wouldn't talk about in a way that's realistic. Uh, and uh, the, the people who were uh, motivated to tune into this particular uh, broadcast are very likely to be people who make a difference in the future. So it's, uh, I, I, you'll, you know that when you invited me, it didn't take me but you know, 30 seconds to agree. Uh, and that's because it's, it's truly a uh, honor. Thank you very much. Um, best of luck staying safe uh, to you and your family. Um, and I hope we have the opportunity to speak again soon. Well, I wish you had a cure for my rabbit infestation, but I don't guess that's gonna happen. All right, I'll get working on it. I'll let you know. <laughs>